much as Chris yearns to get more creeps off the street. It's not something he's always proud of. I gotta tell you, I was pretty taken back when he tossed that knife into the cowboy hat. It was a little bit frightening. Here's a look at the dark side of TCAP, and believe me, there's a lot that you're not being told. And they were just blown away. I mean, some of these guys were in tears. You're living under a rock if you don't know the damage Louis contract, the assistant district attorney from Terrell, Texas, caused for TCAP. I mean, this dude really takes the cake as the ultimate creep. The dude held a position of power in society, an assistant DA for those of you keeping score at home, and still had no problem soliciting explicit pictures from someone he shouldn't be hanging out with. It's like he had this whole secret life going on, and honestly, it's kind of terrifying to think about. Now, let's get to this whole pretending to be a college student thing. Like, what's the thought process here? Did he think he was gonna pull a fast one on someone by pretending to be half his age? It's just plain creepy if you ask. And let's not even get started on the details of the chat exchange with the decoy. It was like he had no sense of boundaries whatsoever. But wait, there's more. This dude actually went as far as discussing all he wanted to do with this person. And then suddenly one day, he stopped responding, adding a whole new layer of weirdness to the whole situation. After seeing the erratic behavior this guy was pulling, Chris was at a loss for work. For this thing house, this is in Murphy, Texas. He was an assistant district attorney in a neighboring county. So back to the story. The cops finally decided to make Condra a visit to his home. And honestly, it was about time someone stepped in. Who knows what this guy could have done if left unchecked. Now, let's not forget that this all went down in a town in Texas. I mean, Texas is known for its wild and crazy story. Maybe not as bad as Florida, but still pretty crazy. But this one was something else, and Chris couldn't stop talking about it. Cops go out to arrest him. Understand. As they would anybody else. As they would anybody else. I'm just glad they got to this contract guy before things got out of hand or, well, uh, forced his hand, I guess. Uh, still, it's a scary thought to think about what could have happened if they had to intervene. Apparently, unlike other states, in Texas, the law says that the crime goes down when the solicitation happens, not only when they show up at the house. But since TCAP had the backing of the police department, they decided to take things to contract. They had him at the tax, right? What's more, the cops and Terrell decided to roll out the big guns and call in the SWAT team for good measure. The next thing you know, the SWAT team stormed in to confront Kondrat, who surprisingly was expecting them. And what did they find? And he's got a pistol pointing to his head. Guys, I'm not gonna hurt you. Conrad was standing there in the hallway holding a freaking ant gun. And this is where it gets even crazier. Conrad looked them dead in the eye and said he wasn't planning on hurting anyone. And for those of you who know about this situation, well, you know what happened next. The dude turned it on himself. While Chris has confronted 200 odd morons during his association with the show, this encounter was unlike any other. You know, ultimately his sister sued NBC for millions and millions of dollars. The case was settled. Right. But when the forensics team reached Conrad's place, they constantly Classificated all his devices, and you wouldn't believe what they found. And to top it off, they also found a workbook titled Investigation and Prosecution of Abuse from a recent district attorney's conference. So not only was Conrad dabbling in some shady stuff online, but he was also brushing up on his legal knowledge. It's like he knew the gig was up and decided to go out on his own turn. But you have to listen to Chris's take on these unexpected turn of events. Also, what was found on that computer was evidence that helped convict Conrad's boss. But here's the thing, why did it have to come to this? Why did Conrad feel like he had no other way out? It's a tragic end to a disturbing story and it leaves us with more questions than answers. Questions like, what drove Conrad to such extremes? And what does this say about the state of law enforcement and online safety in text? One thing's for sure, the whole ordeal is a wake up call. It's a reminder that the internet can be a dangerous place and we need to do better at protecting ourselves and each other. Now, word on the streets is they're still taking cues from the folks over at Dateline NBC on how to run the show. I mean, seriously, are we talking about law enforcement or reality TV here? Take a look at what Chris had to say. He ended up doing federal time. He's the one who got on TV and criticized everybody involved in the investigation. Now, both the police and Dateline crew denied any collaboration. But then Esquire magazine dropped some bombshell footage showing Murphy officers getting cozy with Chris and the crew. It's like they were setting up camp outside Conrad's place, turning the whole thing into a media circus instead of a proper arrest. Talk about priorities, right? And get this, Esquire revealed some information regarding a deputy who wasn't too keen on going through with the bust. Turns out, they wanted to loop in higher-ups before making any move. But what did the Dateline producers have to say? You're working for Dateline now. I mean, damn. Still, Chris had more to share about what went down behind the scene. So, you know, 
there was a lot more going on there than some guy, oh my, I'm embarrassed. So why the rush, you ask? Well, apparently the Dateline crew had their tickets booked back to New York on the very same day as the bus. Again, priority. All they wanted was that juicy footage of Kondrat's arrest before hopping on their flight. But here's the kicker. This whole debacle turned what should have been a routine arrest into a full-blown scandal. It's like the lines between law enforcement and entertainment got seriously blurred. And let's not forget the impact on Kondrat himself. The guy was already in a bad situation, and now he was thrust into the middle of this circus? And well, he paid the ultimate price for being caught up in someone else's drama. That isn't to say he didn't have his hand in the matter, but the folks who pushed him to the edge could have handled the situation more delicately. Like, no, oh, I don't know, for literally every other creep the show's caught? Anyway, the story doesn't end there. First up, Kondrat's sister decided to take NBC to court, demanding a whopping $109 million. And Chris, as the figurehead to the whole operation, was caught right in the middle of it. Um, NBC at the time made the decision to settle the case. But instead of duking it out in front of the judge and jury, they settled out of court for who knows how much. But it was enough for Conrad's sister to be satisfied, so take that as you will. And it doesn't stop there. The Collin County's DA office decided to wash their hands of the whole mess, dropping charges against the other dudes nabbed in the sting, regardless of whether or not they had them dead to rights. And what's the fallout? Dateline NBC pulled the plug on the segment, and Chief Myrick got the boot in 2008. But here's the thing. If Conrad had lived to see his days in court, things might have gone down a whole lot differently. Turns out the warrant had some serious flaws. Wrong date, wrong county, you name it. They couldn't even get the basics right. And guess what? Even an undotted I, uncrossed T, or a simple rounding error could have spelled trouble for the prosecution. We're talking potential acquittal or even getting the case tossed out. And well, even though things went down like this, Chris had something totally different to share. I don't feel responsible for it. I sleep well at night and did after the fact. We completely reported on it the next morning. So what's the lesson here, you ask? Well, for one, the justice system ain't always as just as it seems. And when big media gets involved, things can go from bad to worse in a harp. But hey, Kondrat wasn't the only one who created chaos. Although he does get most of the credit for it, considering how high profile he was and how he ended up going out. If you ask me, Clifford Eric Wallach, or should I say Jason, took things to a whole new level with his action. It was Sunday afternoon, and we had one more man who was going to show up. So this guy started chatting online, talking about having some fun with whatever. And by fun, he meant meeting up and seeing what kind of trouble they could get into. Too. It's like he had no shame, but just a straight up thirst for trouble. But this is where things get really messed up. Wallace decided to bring his five-year-old son along for the ride. I mean, seriously, what kind of parent drags their kid into something like this? It's beyond messed up, and it's downright despicable. He had a description of his car, so we see it pull up, and it's an SUV. And then you've got Frag, the mastermind behind the sting, freaking out because now there's a kid involved. Talk about a heavy burden. He brought his son with him. He's got his child with him. So Chris decided to take upon himself and stepped right into the scene to lay down the law. He told Wallace straight up that he was caught in a sting operation. But get this, he decided not to press charges because of the kid. I mean, this man, Chris, he's got a heart of gold, even in the face of such blatant stupidity. But Wallace, he was all apologies, swearing he'll never do it again. I gotta tell you something, and I'm gonna tell you just straight up right now. But let's be real here. Saying sorry ain't gonna cut it. Wallace's actions spoke louder than words, and dragging his innocent kid into this mess was unforgivable. And let's not forget the other folks in the house left reeling from the shock of it all. But hopefully, this served as a wake-up call for Wallace and anyone else who have been thinking of following in his footsteps. Because when it comes to creepy online strangers, well, there's no room for excuses and second chances. I'm not going to pursue this, okay. but I think you know what you were doing here, don't you? In the aftermath of his poor decision to show up at the sting house, things just kept going from bad to worse for this guy. First off, his son was taken away from him and his wife. I mean, talk about collateral damage. It was a tough pill to swallow, especially for the poor kid caught up in his dad's mess. But guess what? Wallace decided to roll the dice and go to trial by jury instead of owning up to his mistake. And guess who showed up to testify? Del Harvey and Don Pedro from Perverted Justice ready to drop some truth bombs on Wallace's sorry excuse for a defense. 
end. So they presented a recording of Wallace's explicit phone call during the trial, laying bare his intentions for all to hear. And let me tell you, it was not pretty. The prosecutor made it crystal clear that Wallace was itching to do that deed from the very day, and no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But hold up, Wallace's lawyer wasn't out of the game yet. Considering how he swooped in with as bold a defense strategy as they come, he claimed his client was just living out some harmless fantasies and had no real intentions of following through. And get this, he actually told the jury that it wasn't illegal to have a fantasy. Well, I went to go live with other relatives because the mother took the father back in. But I mean, he showed up at the house, so I feel like we're far out of the realm of fantasy at this point. Because fantasies are one thing, but when they involve real people, especially younger ones, it's a whole different ballgame. Wallace might have tried to play it off like it was all in his head, but the evidence said otherwise. So whether Wallace liked it or not, he had to face the music for his actions. Please give me my son, please. After his release in 2012, Wallace tried to rebuild his life, working in IT and starting a family. But in a 2020 interview, he revealed his resentment towards his conviction. Wallace claimed he was unfairly targeted by the state, citing a lack of legal support and allegedly abuse by prison authority. He blamed vigilante groups and Dateline NBC for his downfall, lamenting the loss of his children and livelihood. Expressing frustration over job discrimination due to his past, he called for accountability in the prison industry, vowing to fight back against the system. Yeah, clear signs of delusion right there. But do you remember this guy? Michael Wiles from the Flagler Beach Sting? You ready, Sam? Let's go ahead and get on down there. He's coming. So, dude drove a solid two hours from Jacksonville to get there. Probably thinking he was in for a good time. But little did he know, he was walking straight into a trap. So, Wiles rolled up, struggling to make his way to the house, and boom, he was greeted by the decoy. And what was the first thing she asked for? A bag of M&Ms? Like, seriously, is that supposed to be some kind of weird icebreaker? It was like as if they were setting him up for embarrassment right from the get-go. But this is where things really took a nosedive. Wilde started making some inappropriate moves, rubbing himself and making tongue gestures. Yeah, we're literally getting all middle school up in here. I wasn't sure if you were coming. Oh, yeah. And just when he was getting into it, Chris decided to walk in on him. Almost immediately, Chris hit him with the hard questions, asking about his intention. And what did Wiles say? Apparently, he just came to see her. <laughs> yeah, right. You seem a little nervous driving around out there. Yeah. What are you doing here? I'm coming to see her. We all know what he really came for, but he tried to play it off like he was innocent, claiming he didn't actually want to do anything. I mean, come on, dude. We've all seen the chat log. You can't deny what's right there in black and white. But Miles wasn't done with the excuses yet. Oh, no. He started blaming his age, saying he was past his prime and couldn't get it up anymore. But Chris wasn't buying it. I did not want to have sex with well, That's her. not what it says here. He shut down his pity party real quick. And just like that, Piles was out on the street thinking he was free to go. But surprise, surprise, the cops were waiting for him, ready to slap the cuffs on his wrist. So first off, dude got slapped with not one, not two, but four felonies. And the charges he were facing were pretty serious. The sense of lewd conduct, having a uh, certain kind of on his computer. You name it. He was getting up to it. I say that on all of them. You say that all the time. But wait, it gets better, or should I say worse. After bail, Wiles decided to play a little game of hide and seek with Ha. Classic move, right? Except he wasn't really a master of stealth, getting nabbed for hiding out in his mom's place. I mean, seriously, could you be any more predictable? You may as well have just tried hiding under his bed at that point. And just when you thought it couldn't get any more scandalous, it turns out he was also dodging his child support payment. I'm not in for I'm just in for friendship myself. But things were about to take a tragic turn. Not just for his estranged kids, but now for himself. Before he could even face the music in court, Wiles met his demise in the most painful way possible. Turns out he refused to take his meds in jail and ended up kicking the bucket in 2010. And if that wasn't enough for one lifetime, his own daughters threw a party to celebrate his death. I mean, if they're happy, I'm happy, I guess. But hey, who can blame them? From what Miles' daughters Marsha said in her YouTube interview, it sounded like he was a real piece of work. 
get this. She admitted the only reason she wanted to see him on his deathbed was to snap a pic. I mean, if that's not cold-blooded, I don't know what is. But honestly, I respect. So what's the takeaway from all this? Don't do illegal things. For instance, this guy that Chris talked all about. Oh, and he had a whole setup there. Video camera, tripod, computer. He was going to make a film. And well, when TCAP ended, Chris wasn't happy. There are still creeps worse than these guys out there, and Chris wasn't about to give up yet. And well, guess who made a comeback in 2022? That's right. Chris was back at it with his new show, Takedown with Chris, airing on his streaming platform, True Blue. It had everything that made TCAP great, but a little more modern this time around. Seriously, sometimes I hate having to explain what an IRC is when getting people into the original show. We had been talking internally with my team about doing it, and, and this opportunity presented itself, and once again, it shows that. And this time around, Chris has more freedom to do his thing. He's got full creative control, which means he can drop some serious profanity if he wants to. Talk about shaking things up. Plus, he's teaming up even more closely with local law enforcement, taking the fight against online creeps to a whole new level. And it's proactive policing. It's different than answering 911 calls. You have to go out there. Believe me, this man is on a mission to clean up the internet one bozo at a time. So would you like me to cover episodes from the spinoffs? Make sure to let me know in the comments down below because trust me, there is so much potential there. Creepy your creeps than you could ever imagine. Hey, wait, wait. But before that, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And hey, you can also visit my social media pages and stay updated with all my latest content. And if you're in the mood for another video just like this one, make sure to check this one out right here. It's even crazier.